The story is about a man named Sasaki who starts his day by taking out the trash and is greeted by a young girl, his neighbor. He responds kindly and then heads to work on the train. At his workplace, one of his junior colleagues asked him to review a settlement report. Sasaki offered some suggestions for improvement and kindly volunteered to handle the report. His colleague was pleased with this, and it made Sasaki think that the right person was chosen for the job. While working, Sasaki overheard a conversation about a girl who had adopted a cat. He found this intriguing and watched a cat video with great interest. He thought the cat was adorable and wished he could have a pet of his own someday. Sasaki's boss assigned him more work, which was quite typical in their average-sized company with average earnings and wages. Sasaki admitted that he was barely making ends meet, but he lacked the courage to switch jobs. The job market had not been kind to him in the past. However, Sasaki found fulfillment in having a job where he felt needed and believed he was contributing to society. After work, his junior colleague invited him to dinner, but Sasaki declined, mentioning that he was low on cash for the month. His colleague kindly offered to treat him, but Sasaki took a rain check, hoping for another invitation. Later that evening, Sasaki went to a convenience store to buy dinner, but had no luck in a lottery for a free item. He returned home, and the little girl from earlier welcomed him back. Sasaki had dinner while watching cat videos, thoroughly enjoying them. One day, Sasaki visited a pet store and noticed that the cats were quite expensive. He wished he could afford to have a pet, perhaps even a dog. As he browsed, he heard a bird chirping, and it sounded like it was saying pick me. Curious, Sasaki followed the sound and discovered a java sparrow. He found it cute and surprisingly affordable, priced at 3,000 yen. Sasaki decided to bring the sparrow home, feeling a bit lonely with his 40th birthday approaching. Sasaki wondered about a suitable name for the sparrow. And to his surprise, the sparrow introduced itself as Pircarla, an inhabitant of another world and a star sage. Sasaki thought this bird was quite talkative, even for its species. Despite thinking that Pircarla was already a splendid name, Sasaki decided to name the bird Peeps. This choice didn't seem to please the bird, but Sasaki found even its displeasure cute. Sasaki couldn't believe he was having a normal conversation with a bird. He remembered what Yamada from the pet shop had said about getting Peeps accustomed to human contact and was determined to make it happen. Sasaki wanted to understand if Java Sparrows were generally good at communicating, so he engaged in more conversation with Peeps. He asked Peeps about his dinner preferences, and to his surprise, the bird mentioned Kobe Beef Shada brand, claiming it was the best. Sasaki couldn't believe a bird had such refined tastes. He apologized to Peeps for being unable to afford it and offered pork ribs instead. Peeps responded by suggesting that Sasaki should earn the money if he didn't have it. He shared that he had been exiled from another world and had chosen this new form of life. Peeps believed in living life as one desired, rather than trying to fit in with others. Sasaki could relate to this, given his corporate job. Peeps explained that to achieve his goals, he needed assistance from someone in this world, and he hoped Sasaki would help him accumulate riches. Sasaki tells Peeps that he'll do anything for him. Then, Peeps uses magic to create a special bond between them. He gives some of his magic powers to Sasaki and tells him they're now connected. Peeps asks Sasaki to open his cage. Even though Sasaki is confused, he decides to go along with it and opens the cage. Peeps sits on Sasaki's shoulder, which makes Sasaki feel happy. The bird says he can use his old magic powers through Sasaki's body. Next, Peeps uses a spell to take Sasaki to a different world. Sasaki is amazed to see this new place. Peeps tells him this is where he used to live before he became a bird. They're in a town called Batrium in a kingdom. The story then shifts to Sasaki at his office. His co-worker is surprised to see Sasaki there so early since everyone else is late because of a train delay. He wonders if Sasaki started getting up earlier. Sasaki says no. And then his co-worker asks to talk privately. In private, the co-worker suggests that they start a new business together. He plans to quit his job next month and thinks having someone experienced like Sasaki would be helpful. He promises Sasaki a better deal than his current job. Sasaki asks for time to think about it, mentioning he's busy with personal stuff. His co-worker is surprised when Sasaki says he just got a pet. Sasaki felt that what was happening was just as he had expected, but he wanted to clarify that he wasn't making things up. His life had taken a remarkable turn since his visit to another world, and he had a new goal in mind. Sasaki mentioned that thanks to Peep's teleportation ability, he could now avoid crowded trains, which had made his life much more pleasant because of this newfound convenience. Saki agreed with Peep's idea of establishing a business between the two worlds. As a result, he started buying some items to sell in the other world. Initially, he had aspirations to trade with upper-class nobles, but he realized that it might be challenging to start with them right away. So, they decided to begin by doing business with the town's local merchants first. Sasaki purchased the necessary items and even won a chocolate bar and a lottery. 
Upon returning home, the little girl next door welcomed him back. Hearing her stomach growling, Sasaki kindly gave her the chocolate bar, explaining that he didn't like chocolate and had won it for free. Then, he headed inside and ventured into the other world with his goods. In the other world, Sasaki visited the Herman Trading Company, which was run by the town's nobles. He asked Peeps if he should enter the company with Peeps perched on his shoulder, and Peeps informed him that Sasaki could consider him as his familiar. Sasaki successfully sold the items he had brought with him for 400 gold coins, noting that if converted, it would amount to 400 million yen. He also remarked on the high prices of crafted goods in this world. Mark, the company's president, inquired about the source of Sasaki's pens and paper. Sasaki couldn't reveal his source but made a promise not to sell those items to any other store as compensation. Sasaki continued to travel between the two worlds to conduct his business and explore the local cuisine in the other world. Peeps also provided him with lessons on magic. Sasaki attempted to learn the teleportation spell from Peeps, but he found it too complex and decided to take his time to master it gradually. One day, during a break at his office, Sasaki had some spare time and decided to practice casting spells. He recited the incantation for a fire spell and miraculously managed to invoke it successfully on his very first try. But this activates the fire alarm and Sasaki runs away from the scene. Later, he pays a visit to Viscount Muller, the noble who rules this land, and the Viscount carefully examines the goods he brought. Seeing this, Sasaki realizes that he can't simply bring anything here and he should be more selective about his products in the future. Muller inquires if these goods are common in Sasaki's continent or considered special items accessible only to a select few, like the nobility. Sasaki explains that only a few people possess these goods, and Muller ponders if this implies that Sasaki holds a high status in his own right. He expresses his reluctance to engage in one-sided dealings with someone of equal status to a noble, and Sasaki understands the need to respond carefully. He then shares his story, stating that he is a craftsman who ended up on this continent after his ship wrecked. The goods he brought today are those he had with him, as well as new ones he crafted. Muller comprehends the situation and proposes that Sasaki sells his goods to the Herman Trading Company from now on, with the possibility of bringing some directly to him. He promises to purchase them at a premium price and grants Sasaki permission to visit his mansion whenever he pleases. Muller encourages Sasaki to inform him of anything noteworthy in town that could benefit his territory. This connection with the feudal lord helps Sasaki's trade between the two worlds run smoothly. With his sales, progress in learning magic, and management of his restaurant, Sasaki's life in the other world is becoming more comfortable. Later, while heading to his office, Sasaki attends his junior's farewell party, where they enjoy food and drinks. During the party, news reports about a random attacker on the loose, and Sasaki's junior asks him if he has considered going independent. Sasaki wonders why his junior is so insistent. And his junior mentions that Sasaki seems full of energy lately, radiating an I-can-do-it aura. Sasaki jokingly attributes it to his new bed, which allows him to sleep better. He's been staying in an inn in the other world where the beds are quite large, so his own bed at home feels cramped now. He contemplates switching between the two beds. On his way home after the party, he encounters a dangerous situation. He narrowly dodges ice shards hurled at him and witnesses a man using superpowers to attack a woman. Initially, he considers fleeing but becomes concerned for the woman's safety, suspecting that the attacker may be the one from the news. Sasaki intervenes by using an ice shard to freeze the assailant, though he doesn't want to kill him. He's unsure how to stop the spell, but the woman intervenes, turning the ice into water, and then points a gun at Sasaki. She inquires if Sasaki is a psychic and where he's from. She asks if he was the one who used the ice attack. Sasaki confirms his involvement and explains that he recently discovered these powers. The woman is astonished that she was saved by a random psychic and asks Sasaki to come with her, assuring him that she won't harm him. Sasaki wonders if they might be magicians like him and hopes to learn more from her. He requests permission to go home first and change clothes, as he'll be staying the night. Sasaki explains that he has work the following day, but the woman tells him not to worry as her organization will handle it. Later, Sasaki shares all the details with Peeps, who remarks that he can't sense any mana from the woman. Peeps suggests that she might be using a different phenomenon from magic, and speculates that their worlds might have similar phenomena but operate on entirely different principles. Sasaki realizes that this could be a groundbreaking discovery, and Peeps agrees that they should learn more from her. Sasaki invites Peeps to accompany him, and Peeps agrees. Sasaki is about to leave when his neighbor, the little girl, asks if he's going out. Sasaki confirms this, and she expresses sympathy for him being out so late. She then asks if they can talk for a moment, but Sasaki, in a hurry, suggests they chat another time. The girl agrees, and Sasaki proceeds to meet with the woman, introducing himself as Hashizaki. 
Sasaki, accompanied by his pet sparrow, heads to the organization with Hashizaki. During their journey, she explains to Sasaki that psychics are individuals whose powers spontaneously manifest, similar to magicians. The manifestation rate is 1 in every 100,000 people, and once the abilities appear, they don't change. These abilities vary from person to person, and while there's no record of someone manifesting additional abilities, their existing powers can grow stronger with use. Hashizaki reveals that her ability allows her to manipulate water movement and temperature, which Sasaki finds distinct from magic. Hashizaki mentions that many of these abilities are dangerous, and some psychics turn to crime. Her role is to apprehend such individuals, which surprises Sasaki. She explains that as a general rule, anyone who manifests psychic abilities must register with the country's organization for managing psychics. Sasaki admits he didn't know such an organization existed, to which Hashizaki responds that it's a national secret. They arrive at the organization's building, known as the Paranormal Phenomenon Countermeasure Bureau, and Hashizaki informs Sasaki that this will be his workplace from now on. Sasaki is taken aback by this revelation, as he hadn't anticipated joining the organization. Hashizaki mentions that she registered him a while ago and ushers him inside. Hashizaki tells Sasaki that he can expect favorable treatment, as he'll be considered a government official and receive a handsome salary. She mentions that he'll learn more during training and asks him about his powers. Sasaki, wanting to avoid combat, downplays his abilities, stating that he can only shoot icicles, which he demonstrates. Observing this, Hashizaki realizes that Sasaki can create ice from nothing, which excites her. She explains that she can manipulate water's movement and temperature but cannot create water, requiring her to carry water bottles. With Sasaki around, she would no longer have to worry about that and could undertake more perilous missions. Sasaki thinks she might be a workaholic and suspects she's already planning his involvement in her next mission. He expresses a preference for safe tasks aligned with his skills. Hashizaki mentions that a psychic's paycheck has no limit, and they earn more the harder they work. Sasaki finds himself in a room at the bureau and wishes he could sleep. However, he needs to stock up and visit the other world. He also has to pay French and decides not to use his magic here to avoid surveillance. He takes a walk with Peeps, who informs him that they are being followed. Sasaki anticipated this and knows that stocking up is impossible. He wants to explain his situation to everyone at the bureau and hopes they can help. Peeps suggests that several hours in the other world will only be a few minutes here, so Sasaki should go there under the pretext of using the restroom. Sasaki teleports to the other world from a convenience store restroom, informs Mark about needing more time for their next deal, and pays French's wages. The next morning, someone rings Sasaki's doorbell at 6 a.m. It turns out to be Hashizaki, who tells him it's time for work. Sasaki hesitates, wanting to report to someone higher up and verify if this is a legitimate workplace. Hashizaki expresses annoyance with his hesitation and suggests they stop by the bureau on the way. She asks him to get dressed. The section chief of Hashizaki's department, Akutsu, arrives and comments on Hashizaki's enthusiasm for work but advises her not to involve Sasaki without permission. Akutsu introduces himself as Sasaki's immediate superior and gives Sasaki a new phone. He explains that they will contact him using this phone and asks him to carry it at all times for emergencies. Sasaki isn't too happy about having to carry the phone around, and he considers leaving it in the other world to avoid being tracked. Akutsu, his superior, then leaves, telling Sasaki to contact him if needed. The scene shifts to Sasaki undergoing a medical examination at the bureau and learning more about the agency. He discovers that the bureau is a secret government ministry, and employees must keep its existence hidden. They are officially considered police sergeants but can't reveal their true roles to outsiders. Sasaki realizes this explains why Hashizaki carries a gun and asks about her, suspecting he might be partnered with her. People tell him she can be troublesome. Sasaki finishes his training and receives an allowance of 1 million yen for job preparations. He decides to use this money to stock up and returns home, where he meets the little girl from earlier. She gives him cookies as thanks for the chocolate and asks if the woman with him is his girlfriend. Sasaki clarifies that she's his superior, and the girl is surprised she looks so young. Afterward, Sasaki hears Peeps making noise and takes him for a walk. Peeps informs him that someone bugged his place while he was out. Sasaki asks if they saw him checking the internet, but Peeps says no. Sasaki then disables the camera and microphone at his house. Akutsu calls and mentions Sasaki's talent, but Sasaki asks him not to spy on him again, or it will affect his cooperation. Akutsu apologizes, explaining it was a test to see how Sasaki would react. He believes Sasaki's honesty and skills are valuable for managing psychics. Sasaki understands but remains cautious of Akutsu. 
As Sasaki contemplates his situation, Peeps wonders if he'll stock up on supplies that night. Sasaki decides to do it another time and realizes his dream of a relaxing life in another world is still distant. Meanwhile, Akatsu sees potential in Sasaki's skills for the organization. Next day Sasaki practices magic in another world. Peeps is surprised that Sasaki has learned intermediate spells so quickly. Sasaki credits the magic Peeps shared with him, but Peeps points out that Sasaki's progress is remarkable on its own. He explains that it typically takes over a decade for magic users in this world to reach intermediate level, making Sasaki's advancement in just weeks extraordinary. Sasaki shares that he's learned recovery and lightning magic in today's session. He records these spells in his smartphone, which Peeps notes as diligent. Sasaki explains the need to keep track of all his learned spells, admitting that memorizing them is tough. Peeps suggests using a grimoire, leading Sasaki to ask where he could find one. Peeps reveals that Sasaki's smartphone, containing the written chants, essentially serves as a grimoire. Then, Sasaki remembers they have a meeting with Mark and plans to eat at a restaurant afterward, to which Peeps expresses a craving for meat. Next, we see Sasaki showing walkie-talkies to Mark, who is amazed by them. Sasaki explains they run on fuel, showing him the batteries. He mentions the limitation of the device's stopping once the battery runs out, but Mark remains impressed. Sasaki is pleased, relieved he won't be stuck with unsold stock. Mark thanks Sasaki for providing such innovative items, and Sasaki apologizes for any delay. Mark reassures him it's fine and inquires if things have calmed down for Sasaki. Sasaki agrees that things have settled down, but deep down, he feels they haven't. Mark then surprises Sasaki by asking to buy all his walkie-talkies, promising a great offer. Sasaki is curious about why, and Mark reveals that Viscount Muller instructed him to purchase any exceptional products Saki brings. Mark explains that this request is likely due to rising tensions with a neighboring country, and he advises Saki to stay cautious. The scene shifts to Sasaki meeting French outside his restaurant, which is doing well. Sasaki hands French his monthly pay and some new recipes, asking him to try making them. French suggests discussing the details inside. After explaining the recipes and having lunch, Sasaki leaves the restaurant. The following morning, Sasaki gets a call from Hashizaki for admission. She notices he's still half asleep and wonders if he missed calls from the chief. Realizing he has ignored several calls from the chief, Sasaki rushes to the office, apologizing for his tardiness. There, he sees other psychics and the chief introduces Sasaki to them, noting he'll mostly work with Hashizaki. The others leave after greetings. Sasaki then learns about his mission, a mass arrest operation. The chief explains they're targeting a group operating in the city, composed of unregistered psychics. Sasaki questions if the arrests are due to the group's refusal to register, but the chief clarifies it's because one of their members misused his powers to cause harm. Sasaki realizes the man who attacked Hashizaki is part of this group, and the chief adds that other members are likely involved too. The chief explains they've been investigating this group for some time and have recently located their hideout. The immediate goal is to apprehend them to prevent more incidents. The scene shifts to Sasaki and other psychics heading to the group's hideout. Sasaki is anxious, and Hashizaki advises him to stay calm, reminding him he won't be fighting. Sasaki feels vulnerable, even in a support role, but the other psychics reassure him, confident in their superior abilities. Hashizaki chides them for potentially influencing Sasaki negatively, but they just laugh. Sasaki asks Hashizaki if she's scared of the confrontation, but she shares that the high risk comes with high financial rewards, which she finds exciting. Hashizaki tells Sasaki she's relying on him for support, and he promises to do his best. At the hideout, Sasaki wishes he had learned a barrier spell. The chief, monitoring from the control room, orders them to begin the operation. The psychics enter the hideout, calling for surrender, but find it empty, leading to confusion and suspicion. Suddenly, they hear the screams of officers in the control room through their communication devices. Communication is lost, and attackers use bowling balls and pins in the hideout as weapons against Sasaki and his group. Sasaki and Hashizaki take cover, with Sasaki first thinking the attack is wind-based but then realizing it's psychokinesis. The psychics with them panic, saying they expected these opponents to be weaker. Some flee, and others are quickly defeated, leaving only Sasaki and Hashizaki. Hashizaki asks Sasaki for backup as she moves forward. Sasaki hands her an icicle, which she transforms into water to block incoming bowling pins and balls. Sasaki feels they are only defending and tries to find the enemy psychic. Suddenly, the enemy psychic lifts one of their own and drops him, but Hashizaki catches him with her water. She urges Sasaki to escape, fearing for his safety, but Sasaki refuses to leave her side. 
Hashizaki appreciates Sasaki's loyalty, and he internally admits he can't abandon her without feeling guilty or committing a serious crime like desertion. Then, one of the enemy psychics appears, surprised by their resistance. Hashizaki quickly turns her water bottle into ice, surprising the enemy with her ability to control water temperature. Hashizaki attacks, but the girl dodges and eventually knocks Hashizaki out. The enemy psychic calls out for Sasaki, threatening to kill Hashizaki if he doesn't show himself. Realizing their squad is defeated and unsure of the enemy's numbers, Saki knows he can't outrun her. He reveals himself, and the girl notes he's new. Sasaki introduces himself, and the girl finds him unsettling, guessing he's the source of Hashizaki's water. Sasaki confirms this and is surprised she figured it out so quickly. He tries to regain some advantage, commenting on their fearsome abilities and control over the area. Curious, Sasaki asks the girl for the name of their group, and she's shocked he doesn't know them. Sasaki ponders if the girl's group is well known, and she deduces that Sasaki must be a new member of his organization. Sasaki regrets revealing his inexperience, but realizes it confirms there are more enemies present. He tells her he's a recent recruit and expresses interest in meeting her allies, hoping to determine their number. The girl notes Sasaki's unusual calmness in such a situation. Sasaki responds that his lack of knowledge is his only advantage at the moment. He asks again to meet her companions, but she refuses. Sasaki is disappointed and prepares for his next move. He chants a spell and launches a lightning attack at the girl, who narrowly dodges. She's surprised by the attack. Meanwhile, the psychokinesis user tries to hit Sasaki with bowling balls and pins, but Sasaki defends himself with his lightning spell, accidentally taking out two hidden psychics. He assumes these were all the adversaries. The girl questions what Sasaki and he simply describes himself as a newcomer. He then offers her a deal. He'll let her leave peacefully if she promises to keep quiet about what happened. Sasaki suggests they end the confrontation in a draw, preferring to avoid further risk and injury. The girl agrees to his terms and then intriguingly asks if Sasaki would consider joining their group. Sasaki declines the girl's invitation to join her group, saying he prefers to stick with the crowd. She tells him they'd welcome him if he ever changes his mind, and Sasaki assures her he'll reach out if he does. Before she departs, Sasaki inquires about his superiors, and she agrees to release them since the fight is over. Following her departure, Sasaki reports to the chief that the enemy retreated voluntarily. The chief accepts his explanation and apologizes for the tough first assignment. He advises Sasaki to head home and rest. Before leaving, Sasaki checks on Hashizaki, who assures him she's fine. Hashizaki then asks if Sasaki is free, and he agrees, thinking she might be upset if he said he needed rest. She expresses a desire to thank him properly, and the scene shifts to them at a fancy hotel. Hashizaki thanks Sasaki for saving her, but he modestly says he was just doing his job, regretting his inability to prevent her injury. Hashizaki insists he still saved her life. They order food, Hashizaki gets orange juice and Sasaki beer. Sasaki asks if she doesn't drink, and Hashizaki reveals she's underage, only 16, and dresses maturely so her colleagues take her seriously. She also attends school when not working. Curious, Sasaki asks why she's so dedicated to her job, wondering if she has other high school interests. Hashizaki explains the job pays well. They toast to Sasaki's first mission, and Hashizaki looks forward to his continued support. On his way home, Sasaki sees a girl rummaging through a garbage can for food. He contemplates reporting her but decides it's too much hassle, and he just wants to rest. Suddenly, the girl disappears and reappears flying, then vanishes into a portal. We then see, Sasaki is shown feeding Shadobrian, a delicacy made from Kobe beef, to Peeps as a gesture of gratitude for the support Peeps has provided. As Peeps enjoys the meal, Sasaki reflects on how adorable his companion is. Sasaki shares details about his day with Peeps, who empathizes, feeling that Sasaki's day sounds exhausting. Sasaki expresses regret over not learning barrier magic, to which Peeps suggests that healing magic would also have been beneficial. Agreeing with Peeps, Sasaki requests Peeps' assistance with magic training after his upcoming meeting with Mark, a request Peeps happily accepts. Sasaki looks forward to the training, anticipating a reward of enjoying French's cooking and the comfort of a fluffy bed afterward. However, Sasaki's plans take an unexpected turn following a conversation with Viscount Muller. Muller informs him about an impending war, revealing that the king has summoned him to the front lines. This news aligns with Mark's earlier prediction causing Sasaki to realize the seriousness of the situation. Viscount Muller elaborates on the threat posed by the Ajin Empire, emphasizing its vast size and powerful army, which outnumbers their own by double. Muller expresses concern about the potential damage to the city if the enemy troops were to reach it. 
He then seeks Sasaki's support in the upcoming conflict, leaving Sasaki to contemplate his role in the looming war. Sasaki finds himself in a difficult position when Viscount Muller requests his assistance for the upcoming war. Sasaki, who sees himself as just a humble craftsman, feels unequipped for such a task and expresses his reluctance to be involved in the war. However, Muller acknowledges Sasaki's identity and emphasizes the significant contribution his craft can make to the war effort. He proposes that Sasaki become their exclusive supplier during the war. Muller shares with Sasaki the king's orders to build strongholds and supply the front line. As a nobleman serving the crown, Muller has no choice but to comply with these orders, or he risks losing his status. Muller explains the logistical challenges they face. It takes two weeks by carriage to reach the front lines, and organizing the necessary supplies within a month seems nearly impossible. He has begun negotiations with traders, including the Herman Trading Company, but the soaring prices of goods could devastate the city's economy if they are forced to comply. In response to these difficulties, Sasaki suggests abandoning the kingdom might be the wisest choice. Muller counters this by asking if Sasaki has heard of the Star Sage. Sasaki denies knowledge of it, prompting Muller to recount the kingdom's history. About a century ago, the kingdom was prosperous, rich in magical technology, until exploitation by certain nobles drove the mages away. The Star Sage, a skilled mage, maintained peace after their departure but was later killed by nobles who envied his favor with the king. Since then, the kingdom has suffered from corruption and decline. Muller reflects on how the nobles brought this fate upon themselves and expresses his resolve to protect the people of the land until his last breath, rejecting Sasaki's suggestion to abandon the kingdom. Sasaki apologizes for his impractical advice and agrees to fulfill Muller's expectations. In return, he asks Muller to make him a promise, showing his commitment to supporting the kingdom in its time of need. Sasaki reassures the owner of the Kepler Trading Company that the goods he's purchasing will be put to good use. The owner, noting Sasaki's confidence, observes that Sasaki doesn't seem to be from the continent. Sasaki explains his advantage in moving around under the current circumstance and believes that winning merchants' trust is more about profitability than rank or reputation. The owner agrees and inquires if Sasaki plans to deal with other trading houses. Sasaki commits exclusively to the Kepler Trading Company and agrees to pay in large gold coins from the kingdom. Later, Sasaki presents a warehouse full of foodstuffs to Muller, who is astonished by the quantity acquired in such a short time. Muller expresses gratitude, acknowledging that Sasaki's efforts have saved many lives. He wonders if Sasaki possesses the same instant travel ability as the Star Sage. Sasaki credits Peeps for the transportation, but keeps it confidential for Peeps' safety, requesting Muller to maintain secrecy. Curious, Sasaki asks Muller about the origin of the Star Sage title. Muller explains that the title stemmed from the Star Sage's vast knowledge of spells, akin to the number of stars in the sky. Despite the title's grandeur, the Star Sage was bashful about it. Sasaki internally notes that Peeps seems quite fond of the nickname. Muller thanks Sasaki again, noting that his actions have provided some flexibility in their preparations. Muller reflects on his conversation about the Star Sage with Sasaki, regretting not having been as courageous as Sasaki, which might have saved the Star Sage. Some time later, Sasaki learns of Viscount Muller's death. In a subsequent scene, Sasaki talks with Akatsu, who informs him of a promotion due to the numerous vacancies created by a recent incident. Akatsu appoints Sasaki as an inspector, acknowledging the need for capable individuals in urgent positions. Akatsu acknowledges that Sasaki might not be thrilled about his promotion, given the circumstances, but hopes Sasaki understands the necessity of it. Sasaki accepts the promotion, and Akatsu informs him that his next task involves working with Hashizaki to recruit psychics. Sasaki isn't keen on partnering with Hashizaki, but Akatsu explains the various methods of recruiting psychics, including approaching wild psychics based on police reports and negotiating with irregular psychics. Considering his recent experiences with irregulars, Sasaki decides to accept working with Hashizaki. The scene shifts to Sasaki returning to his apartment, where he encounters the little girl he's met before. She comments on Sasaki's busy schedule and offers to give him a shoulder massage as a thank you for his kindness. Sasaki, who remembers similar offers from her in the past, politely declines. Instead, he gives her some bread he had purchased earlier, which she gratefully accepts. Inside his apartment, Sasaki finds Peeps watching the news. Turning off the TV, Sasaki brings out cake for the two of them. However, Peeps remains silent and doesn't touch the cake. Sasaki, sensing something is amiss, asks Peeps about his relationship with the recently deceased Viscount Muller. Peeps reveals that they occasionally shared drinks and expresses his surprise at Muller's untimely death. 
Sasaki inquires if there are spells in Peep's world capable of resurrecting the dead. Peeps confirms that such magic doesn't exist in his world. Sasaki adds that there's no such method in their world either. Peeps, showing his philosophical side, accepts this reality, stating that he understands everything alive must eventually die. Sasaki understands Peeps' philosophical acceptance of life and death but still offers his support, should Peeps need anything. Peeps lightly comments on Sasaki's ability to sweet talk, appreciating his gesture. The story then shifts to Sasaki's return to the alternate world, where he checks in with French at the restaurant. French informs Sasaki that their old master hasn't returned, but many people are leaving the city, shaken by the news of Viscount Muller's death. Sasaki acknowledges the tense atmosphere. Soon after, Mark rushes in to inform Sasaki that they've been summoned by Viscount Muller's butler. At Muller's estate, they're introduced to Elsa, Muller's daughter. Elsa greets them reluctantly, and the butler reveals there's a succession dispute following the Viscount's death. Elsa candidly criticizes her brother Kai, fearing the downfall of their house if he takes charge. The butler, slightly embarrassed by her bluntness, mentions Elsa's closer relationship with her other brother, Maximilian. Mark inquires about their role in this situation. The butler requests the Herman Trading Company to look after Elsa until the dispute is resolved. Initially hesitant, Mark agrees, feeling indebted to the late Viscount. The butler assures he'll manage Elsa's brothers and the estate during her absence, while Mark commits to taking good care of Elsa. Sasaki, curious about his own role in this meeting, is told by the butler about his tools that enable communication and visualization over long distances. The butler expresses interest in purchasing one of each. Although Sasaki feels something might be amiss, he sees no immediate problem in selling these tools to the Viscount's butler and agrees to the transaction. The butler expresses his gratitude as Sasaki ponders the situation. We then see Sebastian secretly talk to someone else using a walkie-talkie to check if the plan is going well. He tells his supporters not to worry because many nobles supporting the brothers are greedy. The Viscount was the one holding things back, but now that he's not around, it's easier to control the situation. Meanwhile, the two sons of Muller, Maximilian and Kai, meet in the forest. The younger one gives a letter to his older brother before they face each other. Back inside, Sebastian is confident that if they can make the planned marriage happen, everything will go in their favor. He reminds his supporters not to forget his payment for the work. The butler is just happy that he can retire in a comfortable way. At the same time, Lady Elsa has been hiding with the Herman Trading Company for some time and is getting used to it. She shares a meal of curry with Sasaki, and he's impressed by how well the French replicated the recipe. Elsa admires how charming Peeps is and asks if she can pet him. The bird agrees and jumps into her hand, and she pets him, noting how soft he feels. Sasaki, watching, feels a bit jealous as he always wanted to pet Peeps. He jokingly remarks that he's so jealous he could add extra flavor to the curry. However, the bird cries out when Elsa accidentally pokes his eye, startling everyone at the table. To their surprise, the bird speaks. Sasaki and Peep get worried that their secret is about to be exposed. Elsa, realizing the bird talk, insists on what she heard. Sasaki tries to downplay it suggesting she imagined things, but Elsa stands firm. Their awkward moment is interrupted when Mark arrives with urgent news for Elsa to return to the estate immediately. At the estate, they discover Elsa's brother's blade stained with red residue found in the backyard forest that morning. The butler explains they found traces of a heated battle and fears the worst. Sebastian struggles to find words to comfort Elsa about the loss of her family. Despite her grief, the butler makes a surprising request for Elsa to assume her role as the head of House Muller. Mark silences Sasaki when he tries to express his disagreement, and Sebastian clarifies that if Elsa doesn't take the title, the house will be dissolved. Elsa refuses to accept such a fate for her family. She agrees to take the title only in name, with Sebastian handling the estate's affairs until her marriage. Sebastian expresses gratitude for being trusted with this responsibility, but Sasaki and Mark remain unconvinced as Sebastian assures Elsa of his support. Meanwhile, residents evacuate the area due to news that the king's forces have been defeated and the O'Hagan Empire is attacking nearby regions. The trading company moves its goods to the capital for safety. Mark invites Sasaki to join them, but he declines, saddened by the possibility that Elsa's first duty may be to abandon her family's lands. Later, at their secret spot, Peeps expresses a desire to change the course of the war. Sasaki agrees to help, but they can't teleport as they don't know the enemy's current location. Peeps informs him they'll travel using a different method when night falls. Sasaki is amazed when Peeps uses magic to soar through the sky. He can't believe he's flying without any technology. Peeps promises to teach him the spell later. The duo finds the Ohekan army, and Peeps aims to eliminate them in a single blast to avoid unnecessary suffering. 
He instructs Sasaki to observe closely, hoping he might learn the spell someday. Keeps casts a powerful beam that wipes out the entire camp instantly. Only scars from the explosion remain. The bird explains it's a versatile spell that can also be focused into a single point. Peeps takes responsibility for the loss of life, comforting Sasaki. As they prepare to leave, they're suddenly attacked from the decimated area. Peeps creates a barrier to block most of the attack, but they get separated. The enemy targets Peeps, but he dodges skillfully. Meanwhile, Sasaki falls, but he summons water to break his fall. He watches as Peeps and the enemy engage in a magical aerial battle. The enemy holds her own, but Peeps' spell seems to have a unique edge. Sasaki notices Viscount Muller emerging from the forest, carrying an injured soldier. They find shelter, and Sasaki uses his healing magic to help the unknown knight. Grateful, the knight introduces himself as Adnes, the second prince of the Kingdom of Hurts. Sasaki, a merchant doing business in Muller's domain, is surprised to be in the presence of royalty. Muller assures Adnes that Sasaki is not an enemy, and reveals Sasaki's healing abilities. Adnes is amazed and Sasaki downplays his skills. Muller, thought to have fallen in battle, explains that they got separated from their allies during an intense fight, leading to the misunderstanding of their demise. The prince blames himself, but Muller takes responsibility for the situation. Muller asks Sasaki to accompany them to a nearby settlement, and Sasaki gladly agrees. As they prepare to leave, they face a sudden threat, a volley of arrows headed their way. Sasaki quickly erects a magical shield to block an incoming volley of arrows and retaliates with a lightning blast, defeating some of their attackers. Another group of enemy soldiers charges toward them, but Muller skillfully takes them out. Impressed, Sasaki expresses admiration for Muller's combat abilities. As they continue, Prince Adonis thanks Sasaki and Muller for saving his life once again. Muller is surprised by the variety of spells Sasaki has mastered and inquires about his teacher. Sasaki credits his skills to a talented instructor, leaving Muller eager to meet this mysterious teacher someday. Upon arriving at a village, they find it under attack by orcs. Sasaki uses his lightning spell to save a villager, but it attracts more orcs towards him. Despite dealing with them, Sasaki soon gets overwhelmed. In a decisive move, Adnis and Muller join the fight, showing their combat prowess. However, the situation takes a turn for the worse as Muller identifies an elite orc leading the assault suggesting they would need a full regiment to defeat it. Muller advises Adnes to stay with Sasaki for safety, but before they can act, the elite orc enters the fray. Sasaki uses his magic to halt its charge, setting the stage for a challenging battle. Muller attempts to finish off the elite orc, but his attack proves ineffective. The boss orc retaliates by kicking the Viscount to the ground and follows up with a punch that Sasaki manages to block. Sasaki quickly heals Muller while maintaining a protective shield, providing them with precious time to devise a new plan of attack. Suddenly, a massive star-shaped rock falls from the sky, crushing the orc and some of its subordinates. The group is in shock when Peeps descends from above, landing on Sasaki's shoulder. Peeps apologizes for his late arrival, and Sasaki expresses his joy at seeing the bird say. However, their reunion is cut short as the elite monster breaks free from the rubble. Peeps takes charge and summons an earth golem, swiftly dispatching the creature by sending it flying. He notes that elite specimens exist in all species, comparing himself and Sasaki as elite specimens of humanity. Sasaki jokingly wonders if that classification will show up on his next physical examination. Muller is astonished to witness the talking bird and apologizes for dropping Sasaki earlier. The Salarman reassures him that he used magic to land safely. Sasaki introduces Peeps as his magic teacher, and Viscount Muller inquires if Peeps is the Star Sage. He points out the similarities in Peeps' spellcasting and speech to the Star Sage, characteristics Muller can never forget. Peeps decides it's time to reveal his true identity as the Star Sage, leading the Viscount to fall to his knees out of respect. Peeps expresses his happiness at seeing Adnus well. He explains that he crossed to another world in the form they currently see him in and asks for forgiveness for keeping silent about his identity. Muller feels a sense of indebtedness, thinking they owe him an apology for not protecting him. Peeps reassures him, explaining that it's not their fault. The bird then drops a surprising piece of information. The Star Sage has met his demise. However, instead of mourning, Peeps expresses his desire to live a peaceful life as Sasaki's pet. Sasaki adds that he owes delivering the supplies to them to the Star Sage, who also played a crucial role in annihilating Agun's forces. Adonis realizes that the bright light they witnessed was the Star Sage's powerful attack. Acknowledging the Star Sage's wish for a peaceful life, Sasaki pleads with Adnes and Muller to keep the revival a secret. The two pledge to maintain this secret, and with that settled, the Star Sage transports them back to Muller's residence. 
Upon their return, the vigilant soldiers quickly spread the news of the master's return. Lady Elsa rushes out and embraces her father, relieved to see him safe. Muller apologizes for causing her worry. Mark, another merchant, joins Sasaki, curious about the situation. Sasaki, summarizing the events as a long story, emphasizes the crucial fact that they are back safely. He reveals that Agun, the threat they faced, is no more, having been wiped out overnight. Mark is left with a plethora of questions, puzzled by the mysterious turn of events. Sebastian observes the family reunion from a distance, shocked by the unexpected turn of events. Maximilian and Kai suddenly appear, expressing joy at their father's safety. It is disclosed that Muller orchestrated his fake death and staged the succession feud to uncover the family traitor. Elsa, unaware of the plan, adds authenticity to the scheme. The surprising revelation identifies Sebastian as the traitor, collaborating with the house of Count Dietrich to take control of the Muller lands through Elsa's marriage to the Count's son. Sebastian is apprehended for later questioning, and Sasaki admires the Viscount's strategic planning. Grateful for the assistance, Elsa thanks Sasaki and reunites with her family. Next, we see Odinari at her school, realizing that she hasn't seen Sasaki for a few days. She ponders whether his usual routine or work schedule has changed, as he has never been absent for more than three days in the few years she has known him. After school, she heads home, hoping that Sasaki returns soon. On the way, she discovers a woman's dead body and promptly contacts the police. After a while, the police arrive, conduct an investigation at the crime scene, and allow Odinari to leave after a few questions. She overhears some guys discussing that their division will handle the case, implying Sasaki and Hashizaki will be involved. One of them wonders why Sasaki works with Hashizaki, and the other explains that Sasaki is her water source. Later, we see Sasaki in his house, realizing that a few days have passed in his world during his time in the other world. He expected the time spent in the other world to be equivalent to one or two days here. Sasaki notes that time seems to have passed faster than they predicted and he speculates that the temporal distortion between worlds may be variable. He wonders what could be influencing it and suggests reviewing their actions to identify any differences. Sasaki recalls resolving the war between the kingdom and the Agun Empire and solving the succession dispute at Muller's estate. Count Muller, rewarded for saving Prince Adnes, earned a post at the capital and the title of Count. Sasaki dismisses these events as unrelated to the time distortion issue. Hashizaki arrives, reminding Sasaki to leave a notice when going out, and invites him to work. In the car, Hashizaki informs Sasaki that they're recruiting a psychic, a high school student in Saitama Prefecture with recent reports of supernatural phenomena. Sasaki points out that they are the same age, but Hashizaki claims to be more mature mentally. The student reportedly has pyrokinesis, but his output is like a miniature flamethrower, confined to his neighborhood. Sasaki realizes they called Hashizaki for her water-manipulating abilities. Hashizaki confirms this and suggests they get to work. Sasaki thinks Hashizaki's plan sounds easy, but he suggests a more thorough investigation. Hashizaki disagrees, saying it's unnecessary as the student they're dealing with is only E-rank like them. Sasaki acknowledges this but recalls past troubles and mentions Chief Akatsu's permission to use handguns in extreme situations. The scene shifts to the school, where they pose as government observers. Hashizaki notices the psychic student, and Sasaki thinks he looks ordinary. Hashizaki warns him not to let his guard down because the student is still a psychic. As they follow the student, they witness him being bullied by others. Hashizaki wants to intervene, but Sasaki stops her, suggesting they observe for now. Hashizaki is concerned the boy might use his powers, and Sasaki notes that the bullying has been ongoing. Despite the student enduring the mistreatment, he hasn't used his powers in school. Sasaki decides they should approach the boy when he's alone, hoping to avoid hurting his dignity and preparing for a potential future collaboration. Sasaki gets it in his scene in a cafe, reminiscing about his past office life. He used to have a simple lunch in the park, but now he enjoys coffee under a roof. He reflects on life's unpredictability and decides to explore local supermarkets to buy something nice for himself. While in the cafe, he notices the guy they're recruiting with a girl and decides to follow them. Sasaki wonders about the girl in glasses and questions Hashizaki's whereabouts. He realizes he might appear creepy, following the couple, but before he can leave, the earlier bullies show up. The bullies didn't know about the boy's girlfriend and try to convince her to hang out with them instead. The boy defends her, but the bullies persist. The girl slaps one of them, and in anger, the boy uses his pyrokinesis, damaging a plane flying overhead. The plane starts to crash, and Sasaki quickly creates a barrier to shield everyone from debris. After ensuring the girl's safety, she wonders why Sasaki is there. 
Sasaki realizes that Hashizaki is the girl and denies following her, claiming he coincidentally saw them. He expresses surprise at her convincing disguise. Hashizaki explains she thought it was the best way to recruit the boy and asks if the barrier is Sasaki's power. Sasaki has no clue, and Hashizaki suggests covering it up. Sasaki creates ice for her, and Hashizaki turns it into water to knock out the bullies and the target. She contemplates if Sasaki is a magical girl, but he's puzzled by the term. Hashizaki elaborates that there are seven magical girls globally, kids with mysterious powers defying physics. One of them, a Japanese girl, targets psychics. Hashizaki advises saving questions for later, and insists on dealing with the barrier before it gets shared online, potentially affecting their pay. As they discuss, the girl Sasaki saw earlier attacks the barrier, but it holds up against her assault. Hashizaki urges Sasaki to leave, and the girl recognizes him. Sasaki recalls seeing her near his apartment, scavenging for food. The girl asks if Sasaki is a psychic. He denies it, realizing she's a magical girl. She saw a fireball in the sky and notes her beam being blocked, suspecting at least two psychics. Her goal is to kill all psychics without letting any escape. Sasaki asks if she lives nearby. She mentions a large supermarket where they throw a lot of food. When asked why he's there, Sasaki, showing his police badge, claims it's his duty to respond to trouble. He thinks of finding a way to talk to her alone. Another psychic, Shizuka Futari, arrives. Hashizaki recognizes her by the color of her kimono. Shizuka offers help, and the magical girl questions if she's psychic. Shizuka evades an attack, revealing Sasaki's barrier. Hashizaki attempts water blasts, hitting Shizuka, but she heals. In response, Shizuka dodges and knocks Hashizaki unconscious, assuring Sasaki's safety. He questions Shizuka's motives. Shizuka asks Sasaki for help, and the magical girl questions if he knows her. Sasaki agrees to team up with Shizuka, planning to distract and support her during the fight. He asks Shizuka not to harm the girl. While fighting, the magical girl thinks Sasaki is a psychic, but he clarifies that he's a magical middle-aged man using magic. The girl wonders if fairies asked for his help too. Shizuka attempts to attack from behind, but the girl counters, defeating her. Sasaki inquires about the fairies, and the girl reveals she killed them, using their fur for her scar. Sasaki questions her motive, and the girl explains she didn't want to be a magical girl, so she killed the fairies. Sasaki notes her ability to use magic without incantations. The girl doesn't understand Sasaki's magical nature, and he explains his need for incantations. Realizing he's a magical middle-aged man, she questions why he's with a psychic. Sasaki claims they met by chance. The girl contemplates killing the psychic, prompting Sasaki to ask why she despises psychics. She reveals psychics killed her family and friends. Noticing a little boy, she decides to leave for the day using a portal. The story moves to a hotel where Sasaki, Shizuka, and others are. Sasaki thanks Shizuka for her earlier help and asks what she wanted from him. Shizuka says she wants to change her job to work where Sasaki does and asks him to help her get in. Sasaki says he can't decide that. Shizuka suggests he should talk to his boss about it. Sasaki wonders why she wants to change jobs. Shizuka says she's interested in Sasaki. Sasaki says he's just an average guy. Shizuka tells him about his powers like creating icicles and releasing electricity and how he blocked the magical girl's attack. She thinks he's hiding these powers from their organization. Sasaki tries to act like he doesn't know what she's talking about. Shizuka says she'll keep it a secret if Sasaki introduces her to his boss. Then, Akatsu calls Sasaki and asks what he's up to. Sasaki tells Akatsu about their encounter with a magical girl at the scene. Akatsu wonders if this caused the cargo plane from Uruma base to crash. Sasaki explains that the plane was attacked by the magical girl, but they managed to escape because the magical girl changed her mind. Akatsu mentions that a fireball was spotted when the plane crashed. Sasaki clarifies that a boy used his power to protect himself. Akatsu understands and thinks this situation benefits them. Sasaki informs Akatsu that Shizuka Futari want to join their organization, and he arranged an interview for her with their boss. Hashizaki wakes up, but Sasaki doesn't notice. He warns Shizuka that if she gets the job, the boss might put cameras in her house, so she should find a way to get rid of them discreetly. Sasaki admits it's against the rules to tell her, but he wants to warn her in case they suspect her of being a spy. Hashizaki asks if the boss really installs cameras in every employee's home, and Sasaki confirms, saying it's not for bad reason. Hashizaki suggests returning to the bureau now that they've completed their mission. Sasaki notices a store on the hotel's first floor and wants to check it out before leaving. The scene changes to Sasaki checking out some jam, and Shizuka asks if he likes it. Sasaki says he doesn't, but he knows that using pickle can make meat tender. 
Since he doesn't like sour things, he prefers sweet pickle instead. Shizuka comments that he doesn't really understand Japanese plums yet. Later, outside his office, Hashizaki notices Sasaki received a gift from Shizuka, suggesting they're getting close. Sasaki explains it's special Japanese plums handmade by her over many years. Hashizaki warns him about Shizuka's dangerous abilities. She's in a rank psychic with energy drain, which can drain life energy from anyone she touches. Despite looking young, she's over a century old and has strong regenerative abilities. They meet Akatsu, who complains about their delay. He says he's handed the boy over to the department in charge. Hashizaki then mentions she just found out that the section chief puts cameras in employees' homes. Akutsu acknowledges it, and Hashizaki accuses him of sexual harassment. Akutsu reassures her that he keeps it to himself and clarifies that he's gay. Sasaki points out this might be confusing since he's the one who told her. Akutsu adds that he's not interested in Sasaki and wouldn't pursue a workplace romance. He explains they've caught many spies with the cameras, yet Hashizaki still wants them removed, and Akutsu agrees to do it right away. Then, he asks Sasaki about what he's carrying. Sasaki mentions it's Japanese plums and asks if Akutsu likes them. Akutsu admits he does but has specific preferences. Sasaki offers him one, and Akutsu tries it, showing a content expression. He compliments it as one of the best Japanese plums he's ever tasted, surprising Hashizaki. Akutsu offers her some Japanese plums to taste, and she reluctantly tries it but finds it too sour. Then, Akutsu tries to talk to Sasaki about scheduling an interview, but Hashizaki is confused. Akutsu explains that Shizuka asks Sasaki to arrange an interview, which upsets Hashizaki. Later, Sasaki returns to his apartment and meets Shizuka on the way. She asks if she can stay at his place tonight, and Sasaki asks why. Shizuka shows him a bug she found in a thermal camera, claiming she saw a talking bird in his room using it. Sasaki worries she might have hidden a camera in his room. Shizuka explains that the bird seemed to be talking to itself, facing the computer, which intrigued her. Shizuka says she's heard that fairies from another world possess animal bodies when they visit ours. Sasaki pretends he doesn't know, but Shizuka threatens to show the memory card to his boss. She then says she's just joking but criticizes Sasaki for not being careful enough. She warns Sasaki that psychics in their country don't trust magical girls, and even though he feels secure as a bureau employee, he should still be cautious. Sasaki realizes Shizuka took his joke about being a magical middle-aged man seriously, and asks what she wants. Shizuka tells Sasaki that her old organization is after her, and Sasaki realizes she's looking for someone to trust. He understands her situation but worries about the risks of helping her. Shizuka mentions she has a lot of money and suggests they make a deal using it. Sasaki finds the offer tempting because he's been struggling financially lately due to stocking up on goods. He says he might accept depending on the amount but needs time to think. He wants to discuss with his friends first and check for hidden cameras in his house. The next day, Peeps meets Shizuka and introduces himself. He asks how much money she's offering. Sasaki explains they talked it over the previous night, and what convinced him was the chance to eat Shadow Bryant every week. Peeps asks Shizuka if she can pay using something other than money. He notes that her wealth suggests she has connections for buying and selling valuable things. Peeps explains they lack such connections and asks her to share some instead of money. Shizuka agrees, and Sasaki also agrees but wants to avoid workplace issues. Shizuka understands and suggests they may have items from the fairy world to sell. Peeps confirms this, saying they want to sell valuable metals for now. Sasaki realizes their previous problem was converting valuables from the other world into Japanese yen. He suggests they can solve this by using Shizuka's contacts. Shizuka finds this interesting but wants to see the goods first. Peeps says they'll prepare them soon, and Sasaki reminds her it's time for her interview. Shizuka uses a video call to talk to Akatsu. Akatsu questions if she's serious about joining the bureau. Shizuka confirms her intention, but Akatsu wonders if she can convince him, given her past with a hostile organization. Shizuka understands his doubts and acknowledges them. Akutsu recognizes her talent as a psychic. Shizuka asks Akutsu to see her proposal in a positive light. However, Akutsu explains he can't make her an official bureau employee right away. Shizuka suggests she'd be grateful for any opportunity to assist their work. Akutsu agrees to this arrangement. Shizuka then asks about her status. She's open to part-time or contract work as long as she can represent the bureau, but she's concerned others might not see it that way. Akutsu reassures her that Sasaki will oversee her. This surprises Sasaki, who mentions he's still new. However, Akutsu reassures him that he promotes based on skill, not tenure. Sasaki admits he doesn't have much power, but Akutsu grants him the same level of authority as Hashizaki. Akutsu entrusts Shizuka to Sasaki's care. 
The scene then shows them celebrating Shizuka's acceptance into the bureau. They share some drinks, and Shizuka asks if Sasaki enjoyed the yumeboshi she gave him. Sasaki confesses he hasn't eaten it yet but shared it with everyone. Shizuka assumes they must have liked it. Sasaki mentions it allowed him to see a rare expression on someone's face and thanks her for the gift. Shizuka compliments him, saying she understands why his boss trusts him so much. She finds him honest and cute, which surprises Sasaki. Sasaki attributes the boss's trust to meritocracy, suggesting Shizuka's presence must have impressed him. Shizuka believes this means their destinies are intertwined. Sasaki acknowledges that Shizuka may only be a contract employee, but she was still hired, encouraging her to do her best to appeal her transfer to her former organization. Shizuka expresses her preference for being in a close relationship and spreading spicy rumors at the bureau. Sasaki acknowledges that besides a personal relationship, he needs her help to sell valuable items from another world. Hashizaki arrives and hears that Sasaki is responsible for Shizuka. She questions what they're doing, and Sasaki explains it's at the chief's request. Hashizaki clarifies she was just teasing. Sasaki invites her to join them for lunch, and she agrees. Later, she catches Sasaki as he's coming back from the restroom. She wants to talk, and Sasaki says he has something to discuss too. He asks if she can use her hydrokinesis to control fluids inside the human body. Hashizaki explains she can manipulate external fluids, but not those under the skin. Sasaki believes it would have been a good way to discourage Shizuka if it were possible. Hashizaki then expresses gratitude to Sasaki for rescuing her the previous day. She feels she can continue working because of how well Sasaki handled the situation. As a token of appreciation, she gives him some homemade fried eggs. Hashizaki recalls that Sasaki mentioned liking yumeboshi, but not being able to handle sour foods. So, she wrapped the plums with eggs to allow him to still enjoy the flavor. Sasaki appreciates her thoughtful gesture, and Hashizaki suggests he try them when he returns home. Sasaki eats the fried eggs in the restaurant and finds them delicious. Hashizaki is pleased to hear this but feels uncomfortable when Shizuka also eats the eggs. Shizuka teasingly asks if Hashizaki is jealous seeing how close she is to Sasaki, but Hashizaki denies it, feeling embarrassed. This brings him into Sasaki and Peeps engrossed in a Japanese drama, with Peeps clearly captivated. In another realm, the king addresses the nobles, expressing the kingdom's dire situation after the recent battle with the Oban Empire. He emphasizes the inevitability of future conflicts and announces a new initiative for national development and prosperity. The king declares that all potential heirs to the throne can now participate in politics. He plans to pass on the throne in five years to the one who achieves the most remarkable results, surprising everyone. Meanwhile, Mark strolls through town with a friend, who mentions Mark's fortunate investment in war-ending news. Mark humbly attributes it to luck. Suddenly, a carriage nearly collides with Mark, but his friend intervenes. The carriage driver accuses Mark of hitting Count Dietrich's carriage, but Mark denies any involvement. His friend notices their company's manager, Herman, inside the carriage. The scene shifts to Sasaki double-checking his trade goods for the day when he notices Peep gazing out the window. Curious, Sasaki asks what's on Peep's mind, but Peep brushes it off. Just as Sasaki is about to leave, a maid arrives with a letter from Count Muller. Outside Muller's residence, Sasaki observes the guard's formal demeanor, contrasting it with a previous, more relaxed encounter. Upon meeting Count Muller, Sasaki inquires about the reason for his summons. Muller explains that recent royal measures have stirred unprecedented changes among the privileged classes, particularly royalty and nobility. He needs to brief Sasaki on these developments, and Sasaki eagerly agrees, expressing a desire to stay informed about current affairs. Muller reveals that, Post-clash with the Agon Empire, the king has allowed all rightful heirs to participate in national politics, with the throne promised to the most impactful contributor. Sasaki's eyes widen in astonishment at the revelation, while Pete predicts the downfall of the royal family if their nation succumbs to defeat and occupation. Pete finds this sudden change unsettling and questions if something has happened to the current king. Muller confirms that he has no further information beyond what he shared. Peep then inquires about the main contenders in the current competition for power, to which Muller responds that most nobles have aligned with either the first Prince Louis or the second Prince Adnes. Peep concludes that conflict seems inevitable under these circumstances and speculates that the developments must have caught them off guard. Muller confirms this, noting that the noble rivalries have intensified, resulting in casualties. Urgently, Muller advises Sasaki to leave the country promptly and head to the Republic of Lunge for safety. Although Muller anticipates the prince's displeasure, he assures Sasaki not to worry. He offers his connections in the Republic of Lunge to arrange travel. Sasaki, D. 
deeply moved despite his age, acknowledges Muller's concern but expresses his desire to continue business in town. He invites Muller to inspect their merchandise, despite Muller's initial objections. Gratefully, Muller accepts Sasaki's consideration. As they discuss, a butler interrupts with news of an urgent message from Herman Trading Company. Elsa lurks nearby, eavesdropping on their conversation. The messenger delivers shocking news. Mark has been arrested for disrespecting a noble. Muller seeks clarification on the situation, and the messenger explains that Mark was apprehended for allegedly striking Count Dietrich's carriage. He insists that Mark, accompanied by the vice manager, was wrongly accused. Sasaki summarizes the messenger's account, revealing that Mark's own manager is behind the arrest. It all began after the war when Mark, utilizing his skills, profited from early war-ending news. Meanwhile, manager Herman struck a deal with Count Dietrich to establish a new storefront in the capital, Olstos. However, upon learning of Mark's success, Herman grew anxious about his own position. Seeing an opportunity, Count Dietrich conspired with Herman to sabotage Mark. Recognizing Count Dietrich as Sebastian's employer, Saki pledges to visit Mark and address the situation with Muller. Muller expresses relief, promising to confront the noble himself. Handing Sasaki a dagger, he explains that presenting it along with his name will lend credibility to Sasaki's words as his own. Later, Sasaki rides in a carriage toward the prison, reflecting on the situation. He realizes that Count Dietrich, aligned with the First Prince's faction, is targeting Count Muller, aligned with the Second Prince's faction, using the jealous manager's manipulation of Mark. Contemplating a solution, Sasaki declines Peep's magical assistance, preferring a political approach over force. Upon arriving at the prison, Sasaki gains entry by showing the dagger to the guard. Cautioned about a knight loyal to Count Dietrich, Sasaki is escorted to Mark's cell. Mark welcomes him warmly, and Sasaki apologizes for the delay before healing him. Sasaki reassures Mark, having learned of the incident from his company and Muller's preparations to address it. Despite Sasaki's confidence, the knight remains skeptical of their innocence. Sasaki asks the knight to tell Count Dietrich something for him. He advises the Count that despite teaming up with the manager of Herman Trading Company, Mark's business skills are still the best. Sasaki thinks the Count should check out how much money Mark made after the recent fight with the Ogon Empire, even though the knight doesn't take Sasaki seriously. Sasaki doesn't let that stop him. He tells the knight to let Count Dietrich decide. The knight agrees to pass on the message but worries about seeming too supportive of the first prince's backers, since he's loyal to the second prince. Sasaki assures him, saying Mark is more important than his loyalty to the second prince, which surprises the knight. The knight can't believe Sasaki is willing to overlook his duties, but Sasaki doesn't care. He sticks to his priority and tells the knight to tell the second prince if he wants. Sasaki also promises Count Dietrich won't regret listening to him, leaving the knight to figure out what to do with that information. The scene shifts to Sasaki meeting Joseph, expressing his intent to establish a trading company in the city. Sasaki seeks Kepler's investment and support for the venture. Joseph questions the rationale behind accepting such a proposal. Sasaki asserts their inevitability, prompting Joseph to inquire about the basis of his confidence. Sasaki showcases the products he plans to sell and proposes concentrating wholesale to a single client to build brand recognition. While Joseph comprehends Sasaki's strategy, he highlights the significant risk due to their origin in the kingdom of hers. In response, Sasaki offers a solution. He suggests selling several products to Kepler Trading Company on his next visit, allowing them to retain part of the payment as collateral. Joseph agrees to this arrangement, and Sasaki names the new company the Mark Trading Company. The scene transitions to Sasaki contemplating potential trade items in the market. Peep shares his idea of starting with gold as a trade commodity citing its scarcity in Sasaki's world compared to theirs. While synthesizing gold remains unfeasible, Sasaki acknowledges its reliability as an investment. They discuss using gold coins, agreeing to melt them into ingots to avoid detection and increase purity, as their world's gold is pure. Impressed by Peep's insight, Sasaki decides they should head to Count Muller's town for now, leaving the gold melting process to Peep while he arranges transport. The scene changes to Elsa talking to French about Mark's situation which prompts French to push for immediate action to rescue him. Elsa explains that her father plans to negotiate for Mark's release, but he's encountering resistance from someone of equal rank, making it hard to get Mark back without permission. Later, Sasaki finishes packing the boxes and wonders when Peeps will be ready. A maid tells him there's a visitor, who turns out to be Elsa. Elsa asks Sasaki about Mark's imprisonment, and he confirms it. He assures her that both he and Count Muller are working on rescuing Mark. Elsa worries about Mark's safety, so Sasaki assures her he'll come back and praises her kindness. 
Elsa is surprised when Pete suddenly arrives and can speak. She asks him questions, and he introduces himself as Peeps. Sasaki explains Peeps' special abilities and emphasizes the need to keep them secret, as revealing them could be dangerous. Only Count Muller knows about Peeps' ability, and Sasaki warns that they might have to leave town if the secret gets out. Elsa nods in understanding and offers an apology to Peeps for their previous encounter. Peeps reassures her, and Elsa takes her leave. Afterwards, Sasaki packs the gold into the boxes, and the maid notifies him of French's arrival once again. Sasaki reflects on Mark's popularity before meeting with French, noticing Elsa still lingering nearby. After the discussion with French, Sasaki returns to his world with the cargo. The scene shifts to him at a warehouse with Shizuka. Curious, Shizuka asks if these are souvenirs from the fairy world, but Sasaki explains they're just extra items he had. As they inspect the cargo, they are all surprised to discover Elsa concealed inside one of the boxes. Next, we see Elsa's family searching for her in the alternate world. They can't locate her and wonder where she might have gone. The scene then shifts to the warehouse, where Shizuka is surprised to discover humans living in the fairy world. She thinks their clothing looks too fancy for cosplay. Elsa asks Sasaki about the unfamiliar girl. Sasaki requests a private conversation with Elsa, and Shizuka expresses interest in hearing what Elsa has to say as well. Sasaki warns that their discussion will be complicated, and Shizuka agrees to step aside. Sasaki is cautious about revealing too much to Shizuka, knowing she has already uncovered some truths about Elsa. He can't afford to lie further, fearing it may cause problems later. Sasaki must keep the existence of the alternate world hidden from Shizuka but struggles to find plausible excuses. He believes she is too intelligent to be deceived by half-hearted lies. Peeps reassures Sasaki, explaining that Shizuka cannot understand the language of their world. Peeps uses magic to translate Sasaki's words in both worlds. Therefore, Sasaki concludes that Elsa and Shizuka won't be able to communicate effectively, which he considers a fortunate mistake. Relieved, Sasaki asks Elsa to explain herself. During her explanation, Sasaki learns that Elsa suspected him of orchestrating Mark's arrest. Elsa explains that she believes Sasaki's visit to their house coincided with Mark's capture. Afterward, Elsa's family searches for her in the alternate world. Sasaki had claimed he would rescue Mark, but Elsa suspects he's secretly transporting gold ingots, deducing he may have received them as payment for selling Mark to Count Diatrich. Sasaki acknowledges her suspicion, but denies it, explaining they need the gold to save Mark. Elsa asks for clarification. Sasaki explains the gold is from his business earnings and they plan to use it to negotiate with someone there, aiming to regain Mark's former position with the Prophet. Elsa questions the truth of this plan, and Sasaki reassures her, though he worries their arrangement may fail now that Elsa is involved. Feeling guilty, Elsa frets over complicating matters. Sasaki assures her he won't betray her father or abandon Mark. Doubting, Elsa questions if she can trust Sasaki, and he earnestly promises she can. Suddenly, Shizuka attempts to attack Elsa, but Peep intervenes, subduing Shizuka. Peep questions Shizuka's intentions, and she claims she was merely removing a bug from Elsa's shoulder. Later, Elsa's family searches for her in the other world. Peep demands the truth from Shizuka, threatening to curse her if she lies. He attempts to cast the curse, despite Shizuka's attempts to intervene, successfully placing it on her. Shizuka notices a mark on her right hand learning that any hostility towards them will cause the mark to spread, eventually transforming her into a grotesque form. Peep advises her to eliminate negative thoughts to avoid this fate. Shizuka, realizing the seriousness of the situation, ceases her aggression. She admits she had hoped to manipulate Sasaki by exploiting Peep's weakness, but acknowledges her plan's failure. Sasaki decides to send Elsa home due to the danger of their world. However, Elsa insists she has more questions for Sasaki. Sasaki agrees to answer her questions after she returns home. Elsa presses for answers immediately, asking about their world and their identities. Sasaki contemplates how to respond, knowing their relationship with Elsa could affect their ties with Count Muller. He decides honesty is the best policy, and suggests giving Elsa a tour. The scene transitions to Sasaki showing Elsa around Tokyo on a ferry. Sasaki explains to Elsa that they are in his hometown. Elsa is surprised by the ferry and tall buildings she sees. Sasaki asks if she believes him now, and Elsa decides to trust him, realizing the place is unlike anywhere in the Hearst Kingdom or neighboring lands. Curious, Elsa asks Sasaki why he came to their world and what someone from a prosperous place like his would want there. Sasaki explains he came to foster positive relations between the two worlds and seeks peace and good food as well. Shizuka expresses her desire to join the conversation, having gone to the trouble of arranging Elsa's fairy attire. Sasaki apologizes for leaving her out, explaining Elsa had praised Shizuka's kimono early, 
which pleases Shizuka. She offers to get Elsa a kimono, but they both seem uninterested, focusing on enjoying the sights from the ferry. Later, they explore the town, stopping to enjoy some crepes. Elsa enjoys them, making Sasaki happy. However, they are interrupted by news reporters nearby. Sasaki worries they must leave, but before they can, a reporter approaches Elsa. Sasaki intervenes, asking if the reporters are filming live. Learning they are, Sasaki requests they film elsewhere, and the reporters comply, leaving them alone. While Elsa tries to catch a glimpse of them, a child nearly falls into the river, but Elsa saves her using magic. Sasaki instructs Shizuka to handle the situation, and she swiftly deals with all the news channel employee. Confused, Elsa asks what's happening, but Sasaki promises to explain later. They flee the scene, and Shizuka questions if Sasaki has contacted the bureau. Sasaki assures her he followed protocol, but Shizuka warns that the bureau will now keep a close watch on Elsa. Sasaki asks for Shizuka's help to prevent this, knowing she feels compelled to cooperate due to the curse he placed on her. As they run, Sasaki realizes they are already surrounded by bureau agents who had been monitoring them before the incident. The scene shifts to Sasaki, and the others meeting with Atsu and a KSU, discussing their search for a psychic. Sasaki explains the psychic is an acquaintance of Shizuka's. A KSU tries to communicate with Elsa, but she remains silent, feeling unsure if she should speak. Sasaki informs Akatsu that Elsa speaks a relatively minor language, limiting their communication. He insists Elsa is simply accompanying Shizuka as a gesture of friendship. Despite Akatsu's higher position in the social hierarchy, Sasaki notes Shizuka's age and power, suggesting Akatsu wouldn't be safe from her wrath. Akatsu expresses his respect for Shizuka's friend's situation and decides not to inquire further. Shizuka apologizes for the trouble caused, and Akatsu reveals his request as a bureau contractor. He wants Shizuka to neutralize a B-rank psychic with extensive telekinetic abilities from her former organization. Shizuka wonders if this task is a test for her official bureau admission, which Akatsu confirms. He assigns Sasaki as her support but doesn't set a deadline, urging her to complete it promptly. Shizuka agrees, understanding the gravity of the task. Sasaki is uneasy about being involved. Later, Sasaki is seen drinking tea as Elsa expresses her interest in learning more about the world. She hopes to share her knowledge with her father, wanting to be useful to him. Sasaki apologizes but states he cannot allow it. Elsa questions why it's challenging to shelter one girl. Sasaki explains that in their world, everyone has a government-issued identification number that is closely monitored. Without such identification, someone like Elsa, with a foreign appearance and no ID, would draw suspicion from the military police and risk being arrested and imprisoned. Sasaki worries about facing Count Muller if Elsa were to be detained. Elsa expresses her concern that if their world were attacked, they would be defenseless. She believes she must take action to protect her world's interests. Sasaki reassures her that their world isn't as weak as she fears. Peeps agrees, explaining that most weapons in this world rely on heat or impact, requiring time and resources to use effectively. If they can shield themselves in advance and utilize monsters like wraiths immune to physical harm, they could easily defend against attacks from this world. Elsa questions why it's so difficult to shelter one girl, expressing disbelief. Sasaki's displeased with her response, and Elsa notes his unusual expression, remarking that she didn't know Sasaki could make such faces. Sasaki explains it's his homeland, but Elsa finds his expression unsettling. Sasaki wonders if she's joking, but Elsa insists on teasing him a bit, considering his continuous lecturing throughout the day. She compares Sasaki to her father, noting he's the only other person who lectures her as much. Sasaki apologizes for his behavior. Elsa worries her father must be concerned about her, and Pete reassures her that it's normal for fathers to worry about their daughters. He promises to explain everything to her father and admits their mistake for not inspecting the goods before teleporting. Peeps mentions they still have a few hours left before returning, suggesting they use that time to explore and learn more about the world together. They decide to watch a Japanese drama. Meanwhile, Shizuko arrives and informs Asaki that she has inspected the goods he brought and is satisfied with the previously discussed price. She inquires about how Sasaki would prefer to receive payment. Sasaki asks if he can receive a portion of the payment in specific items. Shizuka questions if this is payment for labor, to which Sasaki confirms. Shizuka agrees to his proposal. Sasaki is relieved that he can now acquire items without being questioned by the section chief. He hopes that this successful transaction will lead to regaining custody of Mark soon. Later, he takes Elsa back to her world. This brings an end to our episode. See you with the new episode next week. Until then subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos.